Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, M&T Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors LLC, Genova Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, The Wickhoff Group, Urban American. People from around the world love real estate. People want to buy, own, sell real estate. And where do they want to buy it? They want to buy it in the Apple. And they want to know things about real estate. So today, I have a very interesting individual who has a background in music, who has a background in the arts, but also has a major background because he's the president of one of the finest real estate brokerage in New York for residential brokerage. Today, my guest is... Frederick Wahlberg Peters, president of Wahlberg Realty. Thanks for coming here. I'm delighted to be here, Michael. Thanks so, for having me. Now, now, the interesting thing is it's Frederick Wahlberg Peters. And the Wahlberg has a great name, a great family history. Tell me about the Wahlberg and the shift, because you're in so many years of generations. And, and the, the shift's had sh such an effect on New York with City College and education. Yeah, um, my family... This is my mother's family, and they've been in the city since really the earlier part of the 19th century. Um, my great-great-grandfather, Jacob Schiff, came here, I think, in the 1850s. He was a young German Jew, saw more opportunity in this country, and he... Um, got a job with a broker firm that wasn't actually so much a financial broker as a goods broker. Yeah, they called, were commodity brokers. Exactly, called Kuhn Loeb and Company. And in the way of the world, somewhere along in here, he married Mr. Loeb's daughter. Um, and then over the next 50 years, he built Kuhn Loeb into the most powerful Jewish investment banking house in the United States. And he was, he was an extraordinary man. So that's the Schiff side. That's the Schiffs. The Wahlbergs. His daughter, um, Frida, uh, was taken on a round the world trip at the age of 18 by her parents. And in Hamburg, she met uh, the son of a friend of the Schiff's, and this young man's name was Felix Warburg. Who was also an investment. A, a, the Warburgs also had M.M. Warburg & Company, which was a big investment banking house in Hamburg. And uh, Felix became enamored of Frida, pursued her here and there across the continent, much to the irritation of her father, 
Um, and finally, when he showed up in London, her father was moved to relent to the following degree. He told Felix that he, Felix, could not write his daughter, whom he hoped to marry, but he could write him, Jacob, letters, which if he deemed them suitable, he would pass on to Frida. In the meantime, Frida was permitted to write letters to Felix's mother, which if she deemed suitable, she would then pass on to Frida. And this is the way they communicated for a year until their parents permitted them to become engaged. And then they get married. They get married. He moves to New York because my great-great-grandfather, Jacob Schiff, is a powerful man. He came over from Germany. He was damned if he was having his daughter move back there. And he takes my great-grandfather, Felix, into the business. So Felix then becomes an investment banker. But both he and his father-in-law had an enormous interest in philanthropy. And they were instrumental in creating a number of the major Jewish charitable organizations, which are strong in New York today. They were very involved with uh, the Federation of Jewish Philanthropies. They were very involved with education, including the CUNY system. Uh, they, were in very, they were very involved with creating opportunities for Jewish immigrants, and particularly Jewish immigrants. Right, high S and uh, Right, from Eastern camp. Europe, um, who were coming from, you know, I mean, coming in increasing numbers. And they were also, I think, uh, they were involved with Montefiore Medical Center. Indeed. I mean, they continue. And then the interesting thing is your mother, who's alive, her, her great grand parents were involved with the Abraham and Strauss. Actually, it, Abraham and Strauss was started by, by my mother's great-grandfather. Abraham, Abraham. Abraham, Abraham, exactly. And then your mother's and then father was my mother's Rothschild. My grandfather was Simon Rothschild. He married Lillian Abraham, and he took over the store. And then my grandfather, Walter Rothschild, took over the store. Right, and it wasn't even a store. Besides the store, is they created Federated Department Store. Yes, with, that's with correct. Filings. And now let's talk about you. You're one of four, four brothers, correct? Mm -hmm. And you were born in New York. The interesting thing is your father has German relationship because his family was from Germany, correct? Correct. My father was not Jewish, but his father was a German. Right, which comes later on because that's part of the story of what your father. And I think it's really interesting because your father, uh, as you were saying to me, was going to University of Berlin, going for his doctorate correct. at that time. And the war, he, he gets a, a job as like a stringer with the New York Times. Correct. And he decides, as we will tell later on with his son, uh, about changing careers midstream, uh, he, he says, I don't really want to go for my doctorate. I want to become a reporter for the New York Times. And what happens in 1938? Well, so he became a reporter for the New York Times. Um, and if, a, if you look at front page stories from the years leading up to the American entry into World War II, he's on three front pages a week, he's got a byline. But he had this extraordinary break in that one of his father's German connections gave him a tip that something extraordinary was going to happen at the corner of this street and that street in Berlin at midnight. And so my father hightails it out there um, having no idea what's going to happen, and he ends up being the only reportorial witness to the beginning of Kristallnacht, when the Nazis went down the boulevards, smashing in the windows synagogue. of the Jewish-owned stores them. and burning them, precisely. Right. And so my father witnessed this, rushed back, 
got on the whatever it was, the teletyper or whatever, and he had a world beat on the story of Kristallnacht for the Times. And then in 1941, he was part of the uh, award-winning award Pulitzer Prize that New York Times won. The, the team the that had was awarded the prize for their coverage of Berlin leading up to uh, our entry into the war. So now let's leave the family. Let's talk about your, your, your upbringing. You were born in New York Hospital. I was born in New York Hospital. And where'd you go to uh, school at the initial time? I went to grade school at the Buckley School on the Upper East Side was an all-boys school, very and then, conservative. And then you went to Andover. And then I went to Andover. Now, the interesting thing is, you know, with this background, you know, you said to me you wanted to be a, a pianist. You wanted yeah. to be a composer. How do you how do you get this love for music and well, the it, arts? So? It, I actually think I come by it honestly. Um, my parents are both music lovers. I had a great uncle, one of my grandmother, my Warburg grandmother's brothers was a professional cellist. Um, there's love of music is in the blood in the family. And I started taking piano lessons like any other kid at nine I mean, or 10. You German operas with Vienna, uh, Vienna operas, okay. Yeah, both of which I love. Um, and then one thing led to another and I just got extremely interested. And you said when we were talking, uh, you were tall for your age, and you couldn't, when you were trying to go into the camp, you really couldn't because you had some... I had knee problems. You had knee problems over there, which gave you more time to study... To sit at the piano. At the piano. Now, as you also said to me, many of the relatives from the family had gone to Harvard, but you weren't accepted, and you went to Yale. And at Yale, you had the best times of your life. It was... A fabulous experience for me just because the breadth of opportunity was so enormous. There were just so many different interesting things to learn. And I really tried to pursue as many of them as possible. I've always been interested in the arts. I did art history. I did architectural history. I did music. I did English. I did French, I did some sociology. I, it was just a smorgasbord. So you graduate Yale, and here's the interesting thing. Uh, a Yale graduate, you heard about you, this, this world-renowned composer, Hugo. Hugo Weisskall. And Hugo wrote the opera Esther. Yes. And here's the kid from Manhattan who now takes a trip out to Queens College. Tell me about this trip. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, first, let's be clear about the fact that I was a kid from Manhattan in the sense that Manhattan was a village that I didn't venture out much. So I was totally unfamiliar with Queens. Um, I spent an hour on the number seven train, my first trip ever on the number seven train, taking me out to well, Flushing. How, how old are you? I'm this 22. Time taking me out to Flushing Main Street. Then I get on a bus at Flushing Main Street, which takes me through more of Queens, across the Long Island Expressway, and onto the Queens College campus. So, I, and I've brought my little sheaf of music with me that I'm hoping will impress Hugo enough so that he'll take me on as a private student. So what happens with Hugo at this first meeting? Um, he takes me into one of the practice rooms. He sits down at the piano when he puts my music on the piano stand and starts playing through it. And he's horrified. He starts like throwing the pages over his shoulder saying, oh my God, you don't know anything. This is the worst thing I've ever seen. I, I did not know him at that time, so I didn't know that he was quite given to the rhetorical flourish. Um, so I was feeling about, I'm tall, as you know, I was feeling about two feet tall by the time he had finished with me. And he said, you know, I couldn't possibly teach you. Um, and so I disconsolately gathered up my music and prepared to take the hour and a half trip back to Manhattan. And then he said to me, my wife is coming to pick me up. We have to go into Manhattan. To, to see an opera. To see an opera, exactly. Why don't we give you a lift? And so I said, that would be great. So 
I get in the back seat of the car. His wife is driving at 100 miles an hour. She's now, like at this time, Hugo is the. Uh, He's a distinguished professor, professor of composition at, at the City at, University who's associated with Queens College. Um, and he and his wife are living in Great Neck. So she comes in from Great Neck, picks him up at Queens, and we're hightailing it into New York. And he and his wife, again, something I don't realize happens all the time, begin to have an argument. And the argument they're having is about something I don't recall what exactly having to do with Jer uh, Irish Jews. And he says to her, I'm not even sure, I, can you even name an Irish Jew? And I, feeling like I have nothing to lose at that point, pipe up from the back seat and say, Leopold Bloom. And so he turns around and he gives me this look and he says, have you read Joyce's Ulysses? And I say, yes, I have. And then he thinks for a minute and he says, okay, I'll take you on as a private student. You don't know anything about music, but maybe you'll be interesting to talk to. So Hugo takes you on as a private student at Queens and you complete your master's. I get a master's at Queens, that's correct. Now at this time, when Hugo took you on, you were married? I was not married. I was 22 when he took me right. on. Right, you got married after the master's? Yeah. No, I studied with him privately for a couple of years to kind of get up to snuff so I could get into the master's program. And then and I got married and began at Queens at exactly the same time when I was 25. So you finish your master's and then you said, I really even want to get more involved. And you go to the Graduate Center of the City University, the research center on, at that time on 42nd Street for your doctorate. Correct. And what happened then? Well, the year my wife and I got married, we bought a co-op on Central Park West. That was 1977 when everybody believed that New York was dying and real estate was cheap. Um, and while we were looking for the apartment, I just got bitten by the real estate bug. Right. You, you, I mean, you, you were bitten by the music bug. Yes. You were, you were bitten by piano I had Symphony. several you, bugs. You had several bugs, but one wasn't, you know, in the, in the residential bug. No, it, it, that had not ever been in my consideration set. Nonetheless, I got bitten by the bug, and I started spending my spare time reading books about floor plans. Um, and I finished my coursework for my doctorate after a couple of years, and I discovered that I really was less interested in writing my dissertation than I was in getting a real estate license. So what happens? You, how do you get to LBK? I got to LBK because one of the agents there had been my mother's agent when she was selling her apartment. So I go to LBK, which was a wonderful training ground. Um, I worked there for five years as an agent. I kind of earned my stripes. Um, and then I decided I was interested. I was always ambitious. No matter what I was doing, I wanted to move up. So I decided, OK, I've done the agent thing. I love the agent thing. Now I'm interested in doing the manager thing. And so I managed to get a job as a manager with Ashforth. With Albert B. Ashforth. That's which, correct. Which was an old line company founded like 1890s. 1896, 1890, exactly. 1896. And at that time, they were in New York, they were also in Connecticut, and then they were also in the Pacific Northwest. That's exactly right. And what was your role at Ashforth? I became the associate director of their residential sales department. So I started actually doing some broker management, which, as it turned out, I loved. I just thought it was fascinating trying to problem solve about deals. I still love it, incidentally. So what do you mean by problem solve about deals? You know, an agent comes to you and they have an issue. Um, the buyer won't do this, or the seller won't do this, or the buyer and the seller are $15,000 apart and we can't bridge the gap. So you're, so you're like the judge, 
you're like the person in between saying, let's try to make a deal? Yeah, I, and brainstorm. You know, okay, have you tried this? Have you tried this? Have you suggested this way of crossing it? Have you suggested that the buyer think about the value of the money versus the incremental value of the property so, over so, time? So, Whatever strategy so, works. But, but when you're in management, are you also at that time selling apartments? I continued, I have continued throughout my career to do some brokerage, frankly, for two reasons. One is because I feel it makes me a better manager because I really do have a hand on the pulse of what's going on in the marketplace. Two, because I really think it's fun. I really like brokerage. So, so what happens, so you're now at Ashforth and the company decides that they want to phase out of the New York City market? That's exactly right. This goes into 1990, which as you may remember- was Another not, exactly, economic time. Exactly. It was a downtime, and they came to me and they said they wanted to get out of New York. And they had this, what was at that time, it was a small brokerage department. It was probably 20, 25 agents. And they said they wanted to get out of it. And they said they were willing to sell it to me, but if I didn't want to buy it, then they'd find somebody else who would. So you, so you buy the agent, the brokerage division That's of the company, correct. and you keep the name Ashforth. But I add but Warburg add, to it. Okay, so it was Ashforth Warburg. Correct. Because you felt that the Warburg name you, it was your family name and it would also give some additional credibility to the 100-year-old company which Ashforth was. That's exactly right. So, so now it's 1990, one of the worst recessions. I mean, 76 when you bought the, the apartment was a terrible time. 1990 was another miserable time. So... What happens now? Miraculously, we made money. And we made money every year. Uh, it was a miracle. Um, I mean, I feel like it, probably the fact that I had a great team of brokers, which I expanded enormously over the next decade. You know, we went from 25 to 150. Um, but... It, luckily, the market cooperated. Right, 1996, 19, it, it got better. And then you even took, you know, as just as many, you know, agents and brokerage keep their home on the Madison Avenue, which you've been, mm -hmm. you also increased the size of the company. You decided that go west, as one would say. You well, went, I, I you went it, to Harlem. In my case, it was you went, go south right. first. First, went, I went to the village. Right. Um, and then... I just, the, the, we're getting now into the last decade, 2004, 2005, 2006. I became fascinated by the Harlem marketplace. It was so clearly in transition. And it has, it, it doesn't have much or didn't have much in the way of apartment stock. The apartment stock in Harlem, other than the rental stock, is all new condominiums. But the most beautiful original brownstone stock. And you also had certain apartment houses like on 116th Street, you know, that were built over there and, you know, on the west side. Absolutely. Of, the west Harlem had more of a character than the east Harlem. Yes, and it, it has more character. And it was also um, farther along in the process of there being shopping and restaurants uh, it was just when I was first up there, West Harlem, it was a much more attractive neighborhood with both prettier housing stock, and it, it was more open to affluence. Um, and so we, I opened an office in Harlem, which was fascinating. I, it was a huge education for me, and the firm still does a fair amount of new development business up there. We have a number of different buildings that we represent in Harlem. But you also represent other buildings like on 29th Street. On 29th Street, on 24th Street, we have a big one in the financial district, yeah. And when did you decide to take the Ashforth name and just keep it the Warburg name? Well, I had a deal with the Ashforths in which part of my arrangement with them was that I would keep their name for 10 years, 
and pay them an earnout during that time. That was the way our deal was arranged. And when the 10 years expired, I felt that I didn't need the name anymore. I felt that the Warburg name would fly on its own in the marketplace. And that has worked out great. Now let's talk a little bit about the, the present family. You're married for how many years? I'm married for, I better not get this wrong, 34 years. And you, your wife uh, does what? My wife is a consultant to not-for-profit boards. Right, and you told me that your mother, who's 87, she's been a very interesting, following the, the, the Schiff-Warburg family, she's been involved with some type of major program with hospice work. Yeah, she's quite an extraordinary woman. And earlier, it, it, she's, her career has been a volunteer career, but among her achievements, she has been the president of the board of trustees of Sarah Lawrence College, she has been the president of the board of this organization called the Maternity Center Association, which opened the first out-of-hospital midwife-assisted birthing center in the United States. And her most recent, she always is focused on something involving kind of where she is in her own life. So when she was having kids, that's when she became involved with the whole birthing movement. And then when we were all going to high school and college, that's when she became particularly involved with Sarah Lawrence. And now as she's moved into the latter part of her life, she became very interested in the problem of people with without family or friends who were ill or dying alone in hospitals. So she created a program for to train volunteers to work with and really be like family to people who were dying alone. You have two children. You I have two children. Your daughter's name? My daughter's name is Clelia. She's married. She is married and lives in London. She's with the Boston Consulting Group? She is a consultant with BCG, that's correct. Right. And, and your son? Uh... My son is, in fact, just wrapping up his first day of the, the two-day Kentucky bar exam. And he's going to be, he's going to live in Louisville, Kentucky? He and my daughter-in-law and their baby live in Louisville, Kentucky. And if we didn't, what's the name of their baby? Oh, yeah, the most important person in the world, Owen. So, you know, New York City has so many unusual and creative people, and truly a person with your creative background, it's nice to see that you're helping New York City and people find apartments and homes owning Warburg. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, Michael. Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman, LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns, and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling & Sterling, 
Stephen Napolitano, The Wickoff Group, Urban American. Thank <laughs> you.